Hello, it's Matthew here with My Life in Christ Ministries. Uh, today we're going to be in the book of Philemon. Um, it's a book with a lot of moving parts. Uh, and what I mean by that is we know a lot about what's going on from the answers of what Paul is writing about. So we do something called mirror reading, which because Paul says something, we can infer certain things about the situation that help give details that shed the light on what's going on in the book of Philemon. So we're going to do it a little different today. Instead of being strictly verse by verse, we're still going to do expository preaching, but we're going to paint more of a picture. We're going to talk about um, a runaway slave named Onesimus, and we're going to kind of group it into Onesimus. What does Paul say about him? Philemon, the owner of Onesimus, and also uh, the one who owns the house church that everyone is meeting at, um, as well as what Paul's role is as far as being a peacemaker between these two men who he loves dearly. And it's a really amazing book because we see tons of conflict in the Old Testament. We don't necessarily see a whole lot of conflict between believers post-Holy Spirit um, outside of Galatians with Paul and Peter. And we get a real example here of two brothers in Christ who have a conflict and we have a third party, Paul the Apostle himself, who's acting as a peacemaker. Christ said in the Beatitudes, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And Paul is acting and living out a peacemaker. And that is the whole purpose of Philemon. It's not, you know, should we be involved in social issues? It's that there is no separation anymore between cultural things and the gospel. That being a peacemaker is that you get to illuminate Christ in every situation, and that includes social and cultural situations. Christ is up here. Culture will always be under here, and that's why the Word of God is so awesome, and I, I mean that in every sense of the word. It penetrates every culture to the heart because God is above all. And so uh, let's jump into the text. We'll get going here. Dear Most Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the ability to read your word. And Lord, I just pray that as we have conflict between brothers and sisters in Christ, God, that we seek you first, that it's not about our own rights and our own eyes, but Lord, what you deem to be right from your spirit, which I pray pierces our heart so that we may Bring light truth in every situation. Lord, help us to live at peace as far as it be concerned with us, with everyone in our lives, and to share who you are in the way that we conduct ourselves and also with the praises of our lips. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. So we're going to be in the book of Philemon. We're just going to read the whole chapter here. I know it's a lot. Bear with me. And then we're going to break it down. I'm going to kind of group certain verses together to kind of paint a picture that helps to understand a little better about what's going on. And so I'm going to read the entire letter start to finish here in Philemon. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, Ar Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of faith that you have towards the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, Yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I'm sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this is perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have had him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. 
If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. To say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ, confident of your obedience. I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping that through your prayers, I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends his greetings to you, and so do Mark, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. So what do we got going on here? Well, let's start with Onesimus, who Paul says is like his own son. Paul deeply loves Onesimus. Onesimus is, is a runaway slave that we see. Um, funny enough, in the Greek, Onesimus' name actually means useful. And so I kind of wanted to take a second and look at, formerly he was useless to you, but now he's indeed useful to you and to me. So what's Paul saying here? It's, uh, it would be almost, uh, in effect, like a dad joke in the language where he's saying, like, you know how Onesimus didn't live up to his name before? He was useless. Now I'm sending back to you useful, the one who actually lives up to his namesake. He left a slave in sin when he ran away, but he's coming back to you much more than a slave or a worker, but a brother of Christ. And Paul is really appealing. He, you can So we know he loves Onesimus, but he also loves Philemon. How do we know he loves Philemon? Well, one thing he advocates to him, not because, you know, Paul is this great apostle. He has the ministry to the Gentiles. He has a lot of authority in the spirit and under Christ to just tell people to do what is right and what is holy in God's eyes. But he says, I don't, I'm not doing that this time. I'm appealing to you in love. And we know he knows Philemon because he says, I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. So what is he saying here? He's saying, I'm, I'm not going to remind you about uh, how I'm the one who shared Christ with you, how God used me to preach the ministry of reconciliation. And now you know Christ because of that reminding Philemon of this great debt he can never repay because Christ died for his sins. And why does he do that? Because it really is the parable of the uh master who forgives the wicked servant. He's trying to remind him of how Onesimus has wronged him. Don't get him wrong. We don't know exactly what Onesimus does, but common sense says you have a runaway slave, doesn't own anything. How does he get to Paul's town if he doesn't own anything, has no money, has no food, horse, etc., etc.? Well, he probably had to steal even if he didn't steal, let's say somehow he came about another means to get to the city that Paul was imprisoned in. Um, he still uh, would have robbed Philemon, his slave master, of wages and work that he would have been doing had he been with Philemon. So whatever the case may be, Philemon has lost out on either Philemon's work or physically being stolen from. And so Paul is reconciling him, saying... A, this is a new Onesimus. This is Onesimus who's useful, who's a brother in Christ, who's like a son to me. And B, remember this great debt that our Lord Christ has done for us? Now I need you to forgive him, reminding him first of that forgiveness he's been given. And that, that is the heart of forgiveness for believers. It's the forgiveness that first every day we have to remember that great sacrifice, that great debt that has been paid for us that we can never repay that we have freely received and then we give it to other people and by comparison it's like my personal offense to God okay how's this person personally offended me okay yeah I can forgive this person so that's what Paul is doing here and I think it's very tactful and shrewd how Paul goes about it he doesn't actually mention verbatim what Onesimus does and that's very smart you don't want to if you're acting as a peacemaker list the wrongs and make the other person angry like oh yeah you're right that is how they they wronged me and bring up those ill feelings of anger and hurt and even if those feelings arise paul reminds philemon that we no longer look at situations from a human point of view but we always see them from christ's point of view and he says for per verse 15 
For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you may have him back forever. Paul, in a way, justifies the time that he was apart. He's like, maybe the time that he was away was exactly what God was going to use to bring uh, Onesimus, the runaway slave, to know who God is and to save his soul. And that puts in perspective the hurt and pain that Philemon would have felt. We don't know uh, if Philemon was a bad slave master. I don't think he was. I say that because Paul was very quick to rebuke people in his letters, and he doesn't do that here. He doesn't list anything wrong that Philemon has done. I think Philemon was probably a good slave master, which would probably hurt that much more whenever Onesimus would run away. So why would Paul write this seemingly very private matter between two Christian brothers and want it to be read publicly. And we know it, it was to be read publicly because there are multiple times in verses where the word you is plural, when he talks about the house church, and whenever he prays for them. And a little background knowledge is probably needed for, for Philemon here. We know that Philemon was probably a wealthy man because prior to the third century, they didn't have church buildings. Believers would just meet in the house of whoever had the biggest house. A lot of early Christians just lived in very small apartments, so to speak, that you really couldn't host many people in them. And so Philemon clearly had the biggest house. He could host people. And not only that, we look in verse 6 and 7. I'm just going to read 7. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. And the way that I read that in the Greek is not only is it a refreshment through fellowship and faith, it's a refreshment for their physical needs too. And so he was, I think, feeding people at his house. And having an influential man like Philemon who was hosting and being an early leader of this house church, Paul was hoping that he did the right thing. And we know he's really hoping because he said, I'm confident of your obedience. I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. But it's very intelligent how Paul went about making sure everything, all avenues were covered. Because with it being read publicly, if for some reason Philemon acted contrary to what the Spirit was telling him to do, he would be held accountable by his people. They would hear Philemon's response, but then they would hear this letter from Paul that was inspired by the Spirit, and they would have a heart for forgiveness. They would encourage their brother Philemon to go and be forgiven with Onesimus, to forgive Onesimus. Not only that, uh, whenever Philemon was wronged by Onesimus, the house church was wronged as well. These were people who would have really loved Philemon, this the guy who gave, like opened up his doors to them. He fed them. They would have felt just as hurt as Philemon. And it is important when you receive a brother back in the congregation, not only for the person that they wronged to forgive and receive, but also the entire congregation to no longer hold this offense against this person And as Paul says, receiving Onesimus as they would receive Paul himself to restore him for the first time, actually, into the fellowship of the saints because he wasn't a brother of Christ before this. To give, to instill in him all of the benefits and hold nothing back. And it would have been such a great time of rejoicing. It would almost be like a prodigal son return. It was a prodigal son return in a way. This slave and the sin sinful slave that ran away is now returning back a brother in Christ. This would have been a great cause for celebration. I could almost see all the people going and buying things to have a great banquet and all the surrounding Greeks in the area saying, "Uh, what's this for? Oh, it's for a runaway slave. And oh, did you, are you guys punishing him? Are you celebrating that you're punishing him? They're like, no, we're celebrating that he's back and that he's now a brother in Christ. And so we're going to have a big banquet on his behalf. I just imagine all the Greeks being like, That's kind of weird. And I kind of wanted to bring that up for a second. We read this. It can be so easy to say, yeah, fine, forgive him. Like, what's, this is a no-brainer. But you got to understand the culture at the time. A man's reputation in his business dealings was everything. If, you know, some of the Greeks in the area who were pagan or not Christian heard that Onesimus 
didn't have his house in order and that he was extending mercy, which was not seen as a virtue in the time, they would have, or they could have withheld business dealings with him thinking that he is not a man worthy, he's not an honorable man and that you shouldn't do business with him. It could have hurt his livelihood. And so he would have had to weigh culturally, what am I going to do in order to save face with non-believers? Or do you throw that out knowing God is going to provide every need and say, you know what, Lord, I know what you're calling me to do. I know what you've done for me. And because of that, that is all I care about. I just imagine uh, in his business dealings, being able to say, my runaway slave has come back and we are equals now. And that would have been such a mind blowing concept to them. Be like, your slave ran away and now you're receiving him as an equal. What? And what a great opportunity to say, and it's not because of anything I can do. I would, I wanted him to treat, I wanted to treat him like you do. I could have stoned him. I could have beat him. I could have made an example of him, sold him to another master, let him be someone else's headache. These would have been all easy things for Philemon in the flesh to do. But he said he could easily then make this a gospel conversation and point it to, but because of my God commands me to give mercies, he's given me mercy. I gave him mercy. That's a lot of mercy just then. But God does give a lot of mercy. And they would be like, well, what is this God who gives mercy? And why do I need mercy? And it'd be such a foothold in order to give conversations to people and to share what's going on. And we know that's to be the case because this letter was widely circulated. It's why we still have it to this day. And that's why I also think Philemon did the right thing. So one of the biggest takeaway from takeaways from this is that we have to forgive from the forgiveness that's first given to us. In Matthew 6, verses 14 through 15. Let me just turn there for a minute because I really don't want to misquote it. It's such a good, such a good scripture. It's right after the Lord's Prayer. It says, For if you, if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. We cannot be right in our own eyes. That is something that is straight from the pits of hell that we can look from our own point of view and justify ourselves and say, but I was right in this situation. I don't need to forgive them. They need to apologize. They need to do this. They need to do that. And that's not what it means to forgive from God's point of view. And just remember, this is between two brothers in Christ. So this forgiveness is, um, looks a little different. The heart, the heart is still going to be the same, even when you forgive unbelievers. It's just you may not, you won't receive them as a believer in the fellowship. You'll keep some of the pearls to yourself. You're not going to cast them for swine, where they're going to be trampled on. But it really is an amazing piece of scripture where we see fully that forgiveness is something otherworldly, and by that. We get to glorify God. We get to be strengthened as believers. And that's something I never really thought about until I read this, that normally whenever conflict is resolved in the unity of the body, we keep it to ourselves. We think, well, forgiveness is, is done. We just, we just won't talk about it now. But it really does kind of rob God of the glory of forgiveness because the only reason if me and my brother have conflict that we're able to reconcile is because God has put on our hearts what it means to forgive, and we're able to give that personal trespass that they've done over to God. It's like we both did it, and now we can both glorify God because of that. And then we get to share that with other believers to say, look what God's done for us. Look how close we are when we were so far away. And that's really at the heart what conflict resolution looks like when you're in Christ. Love you all. Thank you.